Father, I do pray that you would give us great hope and comfort and uh, let us uh, find the end or the goal of the doctrine of predestination realized in our, in our lives. Lord, we, we don't want any of this discussion to just be theoretical and, and academic or speculative. Lord, we want these truths to have real and genuine present impact upon our lives. Lord, we want the truth of your word to shape how we live, uh, to even give us motivation or to live more fully for the glory of your name, for the joy of salvation and seeing others brought into that joy. Lord, we want your truth to be what empowers and equips and encourages us to strengthen one another in the faith. And so please, Lord, for all these ends and for the ultimate end of you being glorified among us, we pray that you would give us uh, sound minds and pure hearts as we consider the truths of your word this morning. Lord, help our discussion be edifying and useful. Lord, I... I ask that we would be, uh, that our hearts would be stirred by your spirit to understand and believe in and hope in what's true. God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, yeah, so we're going to jump right back into paragraph 7 of the 1689 Baptist Confession. And uh, you guys know why we're looking into this. It's not only to help us see what brothers and sisters of the past have hammered out and believe about God, but also to help us wrestle through theology and understand how to think rightly about the Lord ourselves. And, uh, you know, our study in this confession, I want to make clear, it doesn't mean that we as a group or we as individuals have to adhere to everything that is written in this confession. This is simply a, a useful platform, like a diving board that enables us to spring off of it into the deep waters of God's word. That's what we're uh, seeking to do. You don't have to hold to this to be a member here. I do hold to this confession. I believe everything in this confession is accurate and true. And so whenever we're walking through this confession, I will start talking about it as, as my own confession. You know, I will start speaking these truths as if they're coming directly from me. That's because I believe that this is an accurate representation of what is revealed in God's word. Um, doesn't mean that we all have to agree, though. Uh, we do need to agree on the fundamentals, and um, you know, everything outside of that one tier, uh, you know, that first tier uh, group of doctrines, we, we can have liberty with one another. We can give each other grace and bear with one another, uh, even though everywhere that you disagree with me, you're all wrong. Um, I, can, I can bear with you. No. You can, bear, you can bear with me uh, where you think that about me. But what we hope is that this is simply a helpful and useful discussion, right, to get our minds thinking through doctrine and theology that maybe we wouldn't talk about otherwise. I mean, how many other times, I know some of you have, but how many other times have you sat down and had a 34-week discussion about the decree of God and what it means for God's decree to govern all things in this world, whatsoever comes to pass. I've no, I don't, I mean, probably collectively, I've maybe had that much time talking with friends and whatnot, but I've never actually sat down with the same group and just had an, uh, tried to have a deep discussion and, and intense on uh, get to, to a deeper understanding of this doctrine. That's what we're doing, just trying to think about things we wouldn't normally think about and wrestle through the implications of those things uh, for, for our lives and for this church. So, with that said, we're going to jump into paragraph 7. It's the last paragraph of this chapter uh, dealing with God's decree. And so it's building on everything that has come before. I'm not going to go through a recap of that for your sake, um, and for the sake of getting through the rest of this lesson today. But um, just keep in mind that what we're talking about here is building upon many weeks of discussion that we've already had. So paragraph seven. 
the doctrine of the high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care so that men attending the will of God revealed in his word and yielding obedience to it may be assured of their eternal election by the certainty of their effectual vocation or effectual calling. In this way, this doctrine will give reasons for praise, reverence, and admiration of God, as well as humility, diligence, and rich comfort to all who sincerely obey the gospel. Now, there are some very, very deep uh, waters here. There are some amazing riches to be dug out of this paragraph. And we're just really touching on just some of them, some of the implications that we find here. Now, we've said before, the, the, the main thought here is having a right response to the doctrine of predestination. Uh, we can sit and theorize about the doctrine of predestination all we want, but if it doesn't actually have a practical impact upon our lives, then we're missing the point. Right? So like the truth of doctrine, of theology, especially of things like predestination and God's sovereignty, these things are meant to have an impact upon the way that we live and the way that we function in this world. How do we, how do we actually walk with God in light of these truths? What, what, what does it mean for our relationships with one another? Those are kind of some of the things that we're seeking to understand. So having a right response to the doctrine of predestination, we've said it involves, first of all, recognizing that this is a high mystery. As the confession says, the doctrine of the high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special, special prudence and care. Uh, none of us are going to reach the point where we have fully mastered this doctrine. That's all that's saying. This is a high mystery that is unattainable for us. We can't, we can't bridge that gap between our responsibility and God's absolute sovereignty. We simply know that both are true. And one day, by God's grace, maybe he will let us understand where they meet. But uh, until then, we must uphold both, and we've got to live in light of both. God is absolutely sovereign. He has decreed all things whatsoever comes to pass. And we, as his creatures who are created with creaturely will, are absolutely responsible for every decision that we make. <laughs> We are responsible for the actions that we do. We are held accountable for them at the judgment seat of God. The fact that Jesus Christ will judge every single one of us according to the deeds that we have done in the body indicates that it matters what we do. So we can't hold up the doctrine of God's sovereignty as something that undermines this reality and truth that you and I are called to action. We are called to make decisions. We are called to follow the Lord Jesus Christ as our King. As Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say? Now, I know that that is dealing with fruit and that those who truly call upon Christ as Lord will obey him as Lord. I get that. But you can't take that and undermine these other passages that are clearly straightforward calls for people to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Your actions matter. So when we come to something like the doctrine of predestination, and we realize that the doctrine of predestination tells us God has chosen from before the foundation of the world some sinners whom he will save for his eternal glory through Jesus Christ, we cannot allow that truth to undermine the, the general calling of God that goes out into all the world to all sinners for everyone to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. This is a high mystery. We don't have all the, all the ends tied up, and that's purposeful. It's so that we would learn how to depend upon God and trust in him and act in faith, right? And when, when we, as I said last week, I think, we want to master everything before we actually embrace it. We want to we master in our understanding a truth or something before we actually take action with it. And it just seems as though the Lord has reserved some of these things from us on these doctrines so that we would take action in faith, trusting in him and not in ourselves. Not trusting in our ability to understand, not trusting in our ability to figure it out, but simply trusting in the God who has revealed his truth to us. So it's a high mystery. And that's where we start to respond to this doctrine rightly by acknowledging that it is a high mystery. 
Then we talked about handling this uh, doctrine, uh, the confession says, with special prudence and care. That is exercising wisdom and great caution, not allowing this doctrine to create an imbalance in our walk with the Lord, as, as I've kind of been already articulating here this morning. And then, I think I'm missing a page. There it is. <clears throat> so we handle it with, we recognize its high mystery, we handle it with special, special prudence and care, and then we seek to gain assurance by or from this doctrine. Now, how do we gain assurance from a doctrine, assurance of salvation, assurance of hope in Jesus Christ that we truly belong to him or that we are among the elect? How do we gain assurance from this doctrine of predestination? Well, <clears throat> one area where the confession points our attention is to the area of discerning our effectual calling. Discerning whether or not we have been effectually called by God through the gospel to belong to him. So has the gospel come with real power and real conviction upon our hearts so that it draws us out of our sin and draws us unto Christ? And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the effectual calling. Jesus Christ, has he, has he come through the gospel and spoken our name and called us out from the midst of the sheep in the pen to come forth and follow him? Right? He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. I call them by name. They follow me. That's all language of John 10. That's talking about effectual calling. So has the gospel, when we're trying to understand whether we are among the elect, we begin by asking, has the gospel had that kind of effectual draw in our lives? Has it come with power and changed us? And has it motivated us to run after Jesus? If we can say yes to that, according to the standards as it's revealed in the word, then we can have assurance and confidence that we are among the elect. We are among those who belong to Christ because his gospel has drawn us out after him, right? So that's, that's what we're looking at when we're talking about, first of all, how do we discern whether or not we are among the elect? How can the doctrine of predestination encourage us? Well, has it, have we been effectually drawn by the Father to come to the Lord Jesus Christ? If we have, then we can have assurance that we are among the elect. And we've read some quotes from Calvin last week. I'm not going to go through all of those, but I think that it's important just to remember that he points out uh, the, the um, uh, what does he say? How does he say it? He says that effectual calling is the first and clearest manifestation of election in time. So if we're going to try to discern whether or not we are among those elect, we're not going to find it out by trying to peer into the eternal decree of God and, and asking God, God, have you, have you made me one of the elect or not? That's not where we're going to find the answer. The answer is going to be found in examining our lives and seeing whether or not the fruit of effectual calling or the fruit of being one of the elect is present in us. And as Calvin says, that starts with effectual calling. Now, to jump on what Zeke was bringing up last week, effectual calling must produce action, right? You have not been drawn in your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ if you are not obeying Jesus Christ in your life. Okay? So this is going to be a second part of discerning whether or not we are among the elect. Not just have we gotten flutters in our soul whenever we've heard the gospel preached with power, but has that gospel come upon our lives and shaped, reshaped our lives with power? Right? Has, it, has it taken us out of our sin and actually moved us into a life of obeying Jesus Christ as Lord? out of a loving obedience to him, not a, not a trying to work for our salvation or gain favor with God by doing good deeds, but simply living a life of love for Jesus Christ who has loved us so richly in dying for us as our Savior and rising again from the dead to be our, our Lord, our victor. Has that motivated us to live for his sake? That's where the confession says here, handling it with special prudence and care so that those heeding the will of God revealed in his word and obeying him 
may be assured of their eternal election by the certainty of their effectual calling. So has the effectual calling, in other words, brought us to the point where we are heeding God's will revealed in his word and actually obeying him? Okay, are you guys still with me or have I just been talking too fast and too much? That happens sometimes. I talk too fast and I talk too much. I was trying to be quiet because I have a friend here today. <laughs> There's a difference between agreeing. We can be in full agreement. We're 100% we agree that God's word is true. But if it's not producing obedience in our life, then where are we on that assurance scale? You know, it's, it's uh, yeah. It, it, yeah, it has to, the power has to have an effect. That's right. Otherwise, the power is not there. You can talk about the power all day long, but if it's not being manifest by, changing us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, we're yeah. not, we're just talking. That's right, yeah. I mean, this is what Jesus is getting at in Matthew 7, right, when he gets to the end in verse 24 and 25, and he's, he's just laid out these great teachings about, really, in essence, what are the laws of his kingdom, right, the laws by which King Jesus will govern the citizens who belong to his kingdom. And he gets to the end of this Sermon on the Mount, as we call it, and in, and in Matthew 7, he gets to the end and he says, he who hears these words of mine and acts upon them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, but it did not fall for it had been founded upon the rock. Jesus says, when you, when you hear my word and you obey my word, you are building your house upon the rock that will stand, that will last. But the one who hears my word and does not obey is the one who builds his house upon the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. I think that's what Luke adds to that. And Luke, I believe it's in six. Great was its fall or great was its ruin. So when we, when we, we can hear the word all day long, but if we actually aren't, if the word of God doesn't come with the kind of motivation and um, I, I want to say energy, but I don't want to use that word because of the way that, oh man, it's got good energy to it. It's like, no, that's not, what, that's not necessarily in this mystic Eastern type, Eastern mysticism type way. Power, yeah, if, if the word of God does not come upon us with a draw and a power that, that motivates us to obey it, then we really can't have an assurance that we, we are hearing the voice of the shepherd as one of his sheep, right? Um, remember what Jeremiah said? Uh, someone can help me with the reference, but I believe it's... Uh, oh, man, how could I forget this? Your words were found, and I ate them, and they became to me the joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Who, who had it? No, that's Jeremiah. Nobody? Yeah, Ezekiel ate a scroll, but all right. Now I got to prove myself to you guys. Put me on the spot here. Put me on the spot. No trust. Yeah, Jeremiah 15, 16. Jeremiah says, your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me joy and gladness in my heart, for I have been called by your name, O Yahweh, God of hosts. See, that, that kind of powerful attachment and living interaction with God in his word, that is the mark of being someone who has been called by the name of Yahweh. Who belongs, who's been called to belong to him. So, so effectual calling. Uh, that is really the, the first fruit that we're looking for when we look at our lives to determine whether or not we are among the elect. Have we been effectually called by the gospel? Have, have our affections been changed 
so that we no longer love the sin we used to run in, but now we love Jesus Christ and we want to live for him. Has that, been, has that change happened in our hearts? And is that change manifesting in action? Are we actually heeding the word of God and obeying it? If, if we can identify those markers in our lives, those are sure characteristics of someone who has been brought to salvation in Christ. That is a mar- those are markers of someone who belongs to the elect of God. So we can have assurance from that. Yeah, say it again, just so people can hear it on the recording. It's not instantaneous obedience, it's progressive, meaning you're, yeah. you're moving along, and over time, I'm becoming increasingly more obedient. Yes, yeah. Yeah, this is what we're, what we're talking about there is sanctification, right? That there is an initial act of sanctification that happens when you are first drawn to the Lord. When you first come to salvation and you first put your hope in Jesus Christ, you are sanctified unto the Lord. You are separated from your sin and separated from the world. You are separated from hell. You are separated from all of these things over here and you are brought unto Jesus Christ. That's initial sanctification. Now, that initial sanctification continues to progress throughout the rest of your life where you are increasingly becoming more and more separated from sin and separated unto Christ in practical ways, right? So yeah, it's not a perfect obedience that manifests in our lives, but it is a true and a genuine obedience, right? It's, you know, I was reading yesterday morning in uh, Psalm 18. Just flip there real quick. This, this kind of uh, obedience to the Lord, we're not talking about a perfect obedience, but we are talking about an obedience where we can consciously say, it is my true desire to obey the Lord. And I, I, with a clean conscience, I actually do move forward in obeying him. It doesn't mean I don't mess up. It doesn't mean I don't sin. But it does mean that there is a genuine, sincere motivation in my heart that leads me to, to offer a life of worship through obedience to Christ. Just look in, uh, I'm going to start reading in verse 16. David's talking about the, the deliverance from the Lord. He's called upon the Lord in the midst of great trouble, and, and the Lord has come. Yahweh has come and delivered him. And he says in verse 16, He sent from on high, He took me, He drew me out of many waters, He delivered me from my strong enemy. And from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but Yahweh was my support. He brought me forth also into a broad place. He rescued me. Now listen to this. He rescued me because he delighted in me. I've, I've never heard a Christian say that. I've never heard a believer say God rescued me because he delighted in me. But look at how David describes what it means for God to delight in him, what it means for Yahweh to delight in him. He goes on to describe that in verses 20 through 24. Yahweh has rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of Yahweh and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless with him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, Yahweh has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands before his eyes. Now, we know David. We know that his obedience was not a perfect obedience. But this is describing a sincere obedience to the Lord. And there's something that needs to be upheld about that in the Christian life. A sincere, genuine obedience to the will of the Lord ought to give us confidence in knowing that we actually belong to him and that he delights in us. That's what David says here. I know he delights in me because I have 
been striving to keep his word. His word is constantly before me. His statutes are with me. I haven't forgotten them. I haven't been the man who looked in the mirror and then forgot what he looked like and went away. I've, the word of God has, has lodged itself in my heart and mind, and I have given myself over to living it out, to obeying it. And that's how I know that the Lord delights in me. I, there's, this, is what, this is what Paul is getting at in 1 Timothy 1 when he tells Timothy to live with a clean conscience. Live with a good conscience. Those who have rejected a good conscience and faith make a shipwreck of the faith. This is what Paul is getting at here when he's talking about walking before the Lord with a clean conscience. Are we sincerely and genuinely obeying God's word? Not perfectly, but sincerely. Does that make sense or did I just confuse? Did I open up a can of worms? It's confusing. Okay, good. Chris? I, I was just thinking um, one way, I don't know, I, I felt like this has looked in my life is it, it's not always that my heart necessarily feels inclined to serve the Lord or that my heart feels inclined to, to resist sin. But, but then when I am serving the Lord, like I, it fills me with joy, you know, it, it's so, I, and then I think of that, it's like working out, <laughs> like you don't always want to do it, but you're always glad you did it afterwards, you yeah. know, and, and likewise with sin, it's like, I don't know, being slothful and eating a bunch of donuts or something. You, you're, you might, <laughs> right. you might be drawn to it, but, but you're going to regret it. You're going to, it's, it's going to, yeah. you know, pull you the other direction. Like you're, you're going to, yeah. you know, want to not do it going forward. And, and likewise, you're going to start wanting, it starts building over time where you, you start desiring that feeling. It's not that you necessarily feel like called immediately to like, oh, th I'm, I, th I'm so excited to go do this thing to serve the Lord, go, go door knocking, for example. But then when you do it, you're like, oh, this is great. Like, yeah. it's great to be serving. Yeah, I, I think that's helpful to think of it like that. I don't think that's exclusive, though, right? Because, I mean, you have some kind of godly desires that are always present if you have the Spirit of God present, right? And that's why we have that call of Galatians 5, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But there are times we all know when we do gratify the, desi the desires of the flesh. The difference between someone who's a Christian and someone who is not is that when a Christian gratifies the desires of the flesh, the Christian is not satisfied with, with doing that. What's that? In a, in, a, in a different sense, the sinner is not satisfied either, and that's why they want more. But for the Christian, it's, it's a dissatisfaction that is rooted in the fact that they know something better, and that's, that's, that's the Lord, right? So neither one of them are satisfied. You're right. And that's why you can never get enough sin, right? And you always need more and you need grosser manifestations of it in order to satisfy you. Just like a drug addiction. What got you high the first time is not going to be enough to get you high the 20th time. You've got to constantly build it. That's the same way with sin. It's just sinful nature. Uh, but, but you're right. Like the, the Christian, when he eats those, uh, those, those donuts and sits around with some slothfulness, spiritually speaking, it never settles right with him or her, right? It, I mean, it's, it's always been empty. Sin's always been empty for us, but, but I still, I feel like there was a time in life where I still could like bask in it, you know, in, in sin and, and not feel like that inner, yeah. you know, pull that, no, this yeah. is, you know, you yeah. can't be doing this. Even that this inner is, conflict. This is killing you and this right. is, yeah. As Martin Luther, when he was dealing with someone who was really struggling with assurance, maybe you guys know this story, he was a young man, he wasn't sure if he was a believer or not, and Martin, eventually Martin Luther told the, the young man, well listen, just go. Go to the bars, you know, go to the brothels, go live out in the world, go, go do, just go sin to your heart's content. And the young man, young man responded to Luther saying, well I, I can't do that, how can I sin against God like that? That's not okay. And Luther basically points back to him and says, behold your assurance, <laughs> right? I mean, you can't, you can't live that way anymore. That is an evidence that you have been brought into new life in Christ. And so it's very good, Chris. Thank you. Yep. I, I, that scripture in Galatians, I really like that. It says, you know, walk after the spirit 
and you will not gratify the desires of sinful nature, implies to me that if we choose not to walk in the spirit, we will get some kind of gratification out of it. It may be shallow, but we, we will be gratifying the desires of our sinful nature when we're walking according to our understanding. So if we walk by the spirit, then we won't gratify, then even if we do do it, it won't be satisfying at all. But if you're kind of like on the fence and you're not really following after the spirit, you do get some satisfaction out of the box of donuts or whatever else it happens to be, you know. But it won't be gratified if you're wholly devoted to Christ. Yeah, and it's, it's Even not, if you do it, it won't be satisfying. Whatever joy or whatever sense of pleasure you get from it is never lasting. It's, it's always an empty, substanceless joy or pleasure. But and, you're walking after the flesh. I, I, I've, as a Christian, I've never sinned and thought, man, that was satisfying. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I can say that with a, with a clean conscience, I think. That, I mean, there may be something I'm not remembering, but I don't know that I've ever, as a Christian, been able to sin and afterwards say, oh, man, that was so good. <laughs> you know, it's always been like gravel in my gut. And it makes you feel empty. It makes you feel miserable. You just you feel in, just just totally uh, disjointed inside. Like this is not this is not who I am. It's not who I'm supposed to be. And I and I, I sense that. Um, so is a guy who brings the donuts sinning too? <laughs> asks the man. Asks the man who brings donuts every Sunday. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'll get you. That's up to the heart of the go man ahead. who brings the donuts. Hold on, go ahead, Miss Alice. Um, I'm viewing this as a love that is either growing yes. or not growing. That's right. And I, you know, it's like a couple that gets married. And they're just so in love, and yeah. then all of a sudden, there's no more growth in their relationship, and yeah. it, and that's why we have so many divorces and yeah. children that are, you know, taken away from their fathers or their mother. It's it's all about being the bride of Christ, and now engaging, the, like tap roots that are going down into. Feed, feeding from the Word of God yeah. that gives us more of that ability to love. We we don't even have the ability to love without God. That's right. Yeah, I, I think that's a very helpful way to think of it. As you're either growing or you're not growing right. in love for the Lord Jesus Christ, for God and His ways. Yeah. Hang on, Can Mike. I, before you go, uh, James had his hand up. Before. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Probably someone on, online. Yeah. Vicky's asking online if you could address what you're reading from Psalm 18 that God delights in me, and also Romans 5 while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, with, with the question how does he delight in sinners? Well, he cannot delight in them as sinners, right? Only, only as the redeemed, those who belong to him, um, as his redeemed people. I think that it's the finished work of Christ that cleans us up, makes us acceptable in, in the presence of the Lord. Uh, positionally or objectively, like that, that will never change. There's nothing that can add to the finished and completed righteousness of Christ. There's, there's nothing that can add to or take away from his atoning death for us. That is, that is our objective acceptance in the presence of God, and that never changes. That's our positional acceptance. However, we do see, for example, in, what is it, Ephesians 4.31 or 4.30? Which verse is that, 31, Grant? Do you have it? Oh, I was going to say Ephesians 2.4. Mr. Ephesians? Go, go ahead. I was going to say Ephesians 2, uh, 4 and 5. 
Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, yeah. made us alive together with Christ. So there is a loving and a delighting, um, be, I would say because of, we'll use the word predestination, but because of this foreknowledge of this effectual call, God can say he delights and loves us even while we were yet sinners because of his decree. That's right. Yes. Yeah, so that, that is a, that is a um, I'm using the word positional because it's a, it's a delight in us that has to do with our position in Christ, right? That we are in his beloved son, therefore we are beloved. We are in the son in whom he delights and therefore he delights in us, objectively, positionally. However, there is also an experiential delight that, that we can have when we walk according to the ways of the Lord that we will not experience when we don't, okay? It is true to say, and, and man, I gotta be, we gotta be really careful on this because it's a dangerous line to dance here, but it is true to say that you can walk in a way that is more or less pleasing to God as a Christian. Right? I mean, this is Ephesians 4, 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now here we have both realities in view. The Spirit of God has sealed us for the day of redemption. That seal will never be broken. Right? That's, that's bound with the blood of Christ. The Holy Spirit has taken us and, and enveloped us with the, uh, the complete righteousness and saving effectual work of Jesus Christ, that will never be undone. We are sealed for the day of redemption. However, even as those who have been sealed for the day of redemption, you can live in such a way that you grieve the Holy Spirit. And so when we're talking about Psalm 18 and, and God delighting in us, and then, and then you see how David describes what it means to... to to have God delight in you, it means you are walking according to his ways, you are living with a clean conscience, you are seeking to obey the Lord truly and genuinely and sincerely. That's not obedience unto salvation, but it is living in such a way that you are, you are, you are um, not grieving the Spirit of God. Does that make sense? So go on. The obedience is a demonstration of the love. Obedience, it's, 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 yeah, it's, obedience love, is a demonstration grows, of love. The more yeah. we will be demonstrating that love in a variety of different ways. Yeah, and that's why I said last week, all of this has to start with the change of the heart, and that leads to the change in actions, right? So, like, the affections have to come first, and then the actions follow. Yeah. Your love for sin has to be broken and has to be replaced with the love for Christ. And then with that, you live according to that love, and you are responsible to live more in keeping with that love than, than you are, uh, and, and less in living in a way that is not in keeping with that love. <laughs> if I can, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking well, of like the texts that are coming to my mind are Galatians 5. I mean, we've been coming back to that over and over again. We, you're walking by the Spirit so that we don't desire, gratify the desires of the flesh, that is what we're talking about when we're talking about this obedience. We're looking at this obedience in David. We're, we're talking about even in the Old Covenant, salvation was a real thing in Christ. Regeneration was true in Christ even in the Old Covenant. David as a regenerate uh, sinner, one who has been redeemed for God's own possession, was seeking to live according to the, the desires of the Spirit revealed in God's Word. And, and that's, that's what we're getting at when we're talking about the difference between being counted righteous in Christ and then actually living righteous lives. The shame becomes greater when we don't, yeah. But like yeah. your love for your wife is well, different than your love for me. True. You think of ways every day, you probably think of a dozen things that you could do or things that you are doing, and you're like, Jamie would be pleased by this. Jamie, you know. I wish I could say that's true. That really? every day I think of dozens of ways well, maybe not dozens, but I, I where I. You, your heart is inclined to think. No, uh -huh. my heart is inclined to love her in practical ways. And show yeah. her that. That's right. Yeah, and that's what the obedience is. 
That's right. Go ahead, Mike. So it seems like There's still kind of a, a mystery here. On one hand, we grow and mature as God wills and desires. Okay, so we cannot cause that growth without God causing us to grow, but we can, we can obey. And so Call the other question obey. that I have is, does the impetus come to obey because of our love of God, or as we obey the Word of God, do we become more loving? I think it maybe goes both ways. Uh, yeah, I would say both. Both yeah. ways, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so it's really, in one way, we turn up our own volition or our own actions to become more pleasing to God or become more mature in ourselves. But it's God growing us through our lives as we, and hopefully mature in him. I think the goal is to be filled to the fullness of God. And I think being filled to the fullness of God is walking in the spirit all the time, which we are not going to achieve. But the more we walk well, in the spirit, the more we're gonna mature. Well, I think, it, mature. I think being filled with all the fullness of God goes back to what Alice was saying earlier about love, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's Ephesians 3, that that we would know the love of Christ, that the, the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge mm -hmm. and thus be filled with all the fullness of God, yeah. right? The, like, that is accomplished by the Spirit, as you said. Right. That's the Spirit of God pouring the love of God through Christ in our hearts, uh, Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith. And, um, yeah, I think... It's almost like a spiral going. to God it is. all the time. It is, know, it is like an upward spiraling dance yeah, with right. God, as, yeah. you, as you would say. Yeah. You, are, you are living this life of love yeah. and, and, and of sincere attachment, yeah. real attachment to God through Christ that is being lived out in your life. And as, yeah. you, as you yield to that newness of nature that God has has, has brought about in you as you yield to that more and more through the days of your life. Yeah, you are dancing Just with dancing God and you are yeah. spiraling upward, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, a, that's an interesting way to think of it. Yeah. Interesting picture, I mean. So I, Ms. Vicki, I hope that answers your question. Um, <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about living in a way that is that is more and more pleasing in the eyes of God because it's more and more in conformity with his will. It doesn't mean that we're earning his pleasure unto salvation, but it does mean that we as those who have been saved are, are giving ourselves more and more over to the things that are pleasing to the Lord. So I hope that answered. All right, let's, uh, let's sew this paragraph up, shall we? So we've been, we've been looking at these different ways, um, or at least this, this one way, that we can discern whether or not we are among the elect so that we can gain assurance from this doctrine. And it's by examining our lives and finding out whether or not we've been effectually called by the truth and, whether, and the way we're going to discern that is whether that effectual calling has actually produced a change in our lives. Do we, do we have a love for the Lord that, that leads us to live in a loving, obedient manner before him? And um, we, we looked at 1 Thessalonians, some of the scripture proofs behind this. We looked at 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 to 5 last week, where um, the gospel came. Paul could say of these Thessalonian believers, we know God's choice of you, brothers. We know that you are among the elect, in other words. Or knowing, brothers, beloved by God, your election. Because our gospel did not come to you in word only but it also came in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full assurance or full conviction. So Paul could say, we know that you're among the elect because of the way that the gospel landed on you. The impact that the gospel had upon you. We know that you're among God's elect. 
First Thess yeah, that's, sure, yeah, that's First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. I like that you said the way it landed on us. I just was thinking about rain -X. It's like if we have rain, -X. rain -X on, the, the water's just going to flow off, and those are the unelect. They have the rain -X. We don't. The water comes in, and it goes in, and absorbs, and... You know, let's, let's use this illustration rather than the rain -X. Um <laughs> Before we were saved, we had hearts of stone, right? Yeah. And uh, I know that you scientists in here will get technical and say, well, actually, water does absorb into rock a little bit and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Just be general with me, okay? Uh, water, doesn't, water doesn't penetrate down into the core of the rock and make it pliable, right? It doesn't make it soft. And when we have, rocks of, when we have hearts of rock, hearts of stone... We're not, going to be, we're not going to be receiving um, the grace of God, the truth of God. It's not going to be impacting us. It might fall upon us, but it's not going to, it's not going to, um, it's not going to penetrate or it's not going to shape us because those rocks are just stone. They're not, they're not pliable. But when you have a heart of flesh and the grace of God comes down upon that soft, pliable heart, that living, beating heart, then it absorbs it, it receives it, it receives the life of the truth and it lives according to it. So that's Ezekiel 36, what you're, what you're saying there, Joy, with the rain X repelling the water. <laughs> well, you don't want heart to of stone, water. heart of flesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is true, like what, what kind of impact does the gospel have upon you uh, or has the gospel had upon you? If you can look back over your life and say, it's changed me radically. Uh, maybe not all at once, maybe in, a, in, a, in years of progression where it's, it's being brought from just one, I mean, that's all of us, being brought from one degree of glory to, the, to another, 2 Corinthians 3. But we can discern that the gospel has had a great impact on us. Um, that's what Paul says, we know that you are among the elect because of that. Now, then you also have 2 Peter 1.10. Where Peter writes, um, that's First Peter 1.10, that's not going to help. Second Peter 1.10, um, start in verse 8, after he's talked about adding to our faith um, moral excellence and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and kindness and brotherly, brotherly kindness and love, he says in verse 8, if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in whom these things are not present, these, these things that he's calling for them to grow in, in whom these things are not present, that one is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. Look at verse 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and choosing sure, or to make your calling and your election sure. For in doing these things, you will never stumble. And in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, what is this? other than if it is not a calling for Christians to make sure that they are among the elect. Right? Make your calling and your election sure. Right? How do we do that? Well, Peter says, by, dis by discerning whether or not you are growing in these godly virtues that are strengthening your faith and increasing your love attachment to Jesus Christ. Make your calling and your election sure. And as you do that, you notice the effect of that. It gives you, uh, in this way, verse 11, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. There will be a power, there will be a working of God in your heart that makes entering into the kingdom of heaven something that is richly supplied to you, where you're not filled with doubt, you're not filled with discouragement and, and distrust of the Lord, but your faith is increasing. Uh, you are gaining victory in the world, and you are gaining confidence that, that to depart and be with Christ is far better. 
as you live out your days in this world. That's not talking about gaining, you know, opening the gate of heaven wider so that we gain an entrance by increasing in these things. That's talking about our assurance of getting to heaven, going to glory. It will be richly and abundantly supplied to us as we grow in these godly virtues if we have true and genuine faith. Our confidence will be increased. So, yeah. So that's, that's that scriptural proof, that calling for us to use even the doctrine of election to gain assurance. Now, I've got three minutes. Let me try and sew this part up here, and we'll be done. Next week, I, I think we're going to try and do something else during this time. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but I will, I will send out an email and let you know what that will be like this week. But notice, lastly, the fruit of assurance. What is, what is gaining assurance from the doctrine of predestination supposed to uh, bring about in our lives? What does God intend for the doctrine of predestination to produce in us? Um, you see in the paragraph it says, the last ver- or verse, the last sentence, in this way, right? Um, in this way, handling this doctrine with special prudence and care, a discerning, um, being assured of our eternal election by the certainty of our effectual calling, in this way, this doctrine will give reasons for praise, reverence, and admiration of God, as well as humility, diligence, and rich comfort to all who sincerely obey the gospel. There you see that language of sincerity, genuineness again, what I've been talking about all morning. But look at what, look at what this assurance and gaining an assurance of, of being among the elect is intended to produce. This is God's intention behind revealing the doctrine of predestination, in other words. It's so that praise in the lives of his people would be increased. It's so that his people would increase in their reverence for God, that they would increase in their admiration of God. It's that they would increase in their humility before God, that they would increase in their diligent pursuit of him, and that they would increase in their comfort before him. In other words, the point here is that this doctrine of predestination is not meant to lead us into the sewer of despair or doubt or insecurity. God revealed this truth to us in his word in order to produce godly and joyful worship unto him. And then I've got scripture proofs listed underneath there. Ephesians 1, 4 to 6. Election is meant to lead to praise and admiration of God even uh, unto eternity. It's to the praise of his glorious grace. Romans 11, verses 5 through 6, it speaks of election as something that should produce humility. Uh, you see that same, in Romans, same thing in Romans 11, verse 20. It should produce a fear, a right godly fear, and a humility before the Lord. Not a presumption, but a true trembling before the Lord and walking with care and vigilance. In Romans eleven thirty three, 33, Paul closing... His closing response to the largest treatment of the doctrine of election in the entire scriptures, he closes it out by giving praise to God. Oh, the depths of the, and riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, right? How inscrutable are his judgments, how unfathomable, unfathomable his ways. Right? For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should be his counselor? Who has given to the Lord that he might be repaid? For from him and to him and through him are all things. To whom be the glory forever. Amen. So Paul gets to the end of treating this largest treatment on the doctrine of election, and it produces in him, as one of the elect, deep and reverential praise. And in uh, Luke uh, 10, 20, Jesus says, Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. In Luke 10, 20. Now that means that we can know and recognize whether or not our names actually are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. And it is something that Jesus wants us to rejoice in. That's really important. Election is not something that we're just meant to use in arguments and debates to beat people up with. And uh, The doctrine of election is meant to be a comfort. It's meant to give assurance. It's meant to increase our praise. And it's meant to be something that we rejoice in. And so... 
That's the end of, of our discussion on God's decree, chapter 3 of the 1689 Confession. Thank you for the applause. We did, we did finish this chapter. Uh, maybe not with everything we could have said, but probably far more than we should have said. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, many, many more chapters left. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the rich, deep uh, discussion uh, about uh, election and predestination and, and all this stuff revolving. Uh, or, or, or being produced by a discussion of your decree. Lord, you truly do reign over all things as the ultimate sovereign. And I thank you that you are bringing all things, no matter how bad the world looks, no matter how bad the, the situation seems, you are bringing all of it to your ordained end, that all things would serve the glory of your King, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, you have chosen him. You have seated him on the throne. And in his hand, your will is prospering. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that we would take hope in that and be encouraged and uh, live our lives for the glory of your name and with, a, with a richer zeal and a greater assurance in the days ahead. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you all.